Hello, this is Amy Brown, Director of Events and Education for Trade Press Media Group. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Back to Business, Pest Control and Your Property Reentry Plan. Our presenter today is Dr. Benjamin Hoddle, Technical Service Manager for Orkin. Benjamin provides technical support and guidance across all Rawlings brands in the areas of training, education, operations, and marketing. Today's learning objectives include learn about seasonal pests that could be lurking near or in your property, discover preventative maintenance measures you can take to help protect your tenants and employees, get tips for working with your pest control provider to build an effective integrated pest management plan that helps deter pests. Before we get started with today's event, I'd like to cover a few details. A live question and answer session will follow today's presentation. To submit your questions, please navigate to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions. Our presenter will answer as many questions as time permits. At the conclusion of today's webcast, you'll receive a PDF copy of today's presentation slides. You'll also receive a link to a brief online assessment. Upon successful completion of this assessment, you'll receive your CEU certificate that you'll be able to self-report to any license or association board. Today's event will also be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcasts. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Benjamin. Awesome. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and so, yeah, my, my name is Ben Pottle over at Workin, and uh, happy to talk to you all about getting back to uh, your facilities and um, opening up after kind of this lull because of uh, the COVID um, pandemic and kind of we've been seeing more and more people coming into offices and other other buildings um, as we go into the summer. So it's been kind of an exciting time, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we are uh, prepared for any possible pest issues that may pop up um, while everyone is coming back into the office. And so. One of the first things I'm going to talk about is just kind of the different pest patterns that we have seen and pest issues we saw during COVID and then actually after COVID, what we're seeing kind of like right now. And then I'm going to go over different types of pests, seasonal and ongoing pests that can pop up uh, either this summer or in the fall, in the spring, in the winter. And I think I'm going to establish some really good bi biological background for those pests so that you kind of get an idea of why we want to take these proactive prevention tips uh, that I'm going to cover, which is going to be more on exclusion, sanitation, and then even some preventative uh, pest control measures that you can take with a pest control provider. And so I think that com combination of this uh, natural history background on these pests um, will kind of give you a good idea of, well, maybe I should take some extra steps um, as people start coming back into the offices or any other facilities that you uh, run. And so we'll, do, we'll kind of finish it up with a Q&A session that you can ask some of the questions that you have um, as I'm covering some of these different topics. So during the pandemic, we saw a lot of different facilities close. People started to work from home uh, more and it was kind of interesting to start getting more and more residential calls for pest related issues. Um, as opposed to commercial calls. And as we're kind of transitioning back into uh, these commercial facilities, we're seeing a little bit of a, a change in pattern of that. So you, you were having a lot of people not observing pest issues during the pandemic because they weren't in the office or they weren't at these facilities. Um, there was limited human capacity. So you had less people there, less people seeing things that are pest related problems. And we did notice some changes in sanitation behavior. Sometimes you, there may have not been house cleaning, cleaning things as regularly, um, getting trash taken out as regularly. That can lead to certain problems if people start coming back in. And so post pandemic, now we're seeing more and more people coming back. Um, we have people coming back once a week, uh, throughout the entire week, maybe it didn't even change. Maybe uh, they've been coming in the entire time, uh, adjustable employees uh, schedules and then sanitation and start picking, picking up more and more, hopefully. Um, and so these are just things to keep in mind that the pests have always been here, um, even if we weren't there. 
they're on the outside, they're on the inside, um, and changing our behavior can have impacts on these pests. And I know um, back in uh, last spring, uh, there was a lot of stuff in the news about rodent problems in New York City. And when all the restaurants closed down, um, they started seeing rats, nori rats that were uh, on the lookout for new food sources because the restaurants were closed. And so we, we saw some aggression on rats, on rats attacking each other because they didn't have all this food, looking to residential areas for additional food sources. Um, and so those are just kind of some examples of even if we change our behavior, sometimes that will lead to a change in the pest behavior too. And so it's good to keep that in mind. So I'll, I'll kind of go over some of the um, important uh, background that everyone should know going into reopening the facility. And one of the basic concepts that I wanted to cover, and I usually try to cover this all the time, is integrated pest management. And previously, historically, pest control, we, we kind of did a lot of um, more just focusing on chemicals, um, not on uh, an integrative approach. And so that was, you know, 30 or so years ago. Now we're looking more at the integrated approach where we're looking at what type of preventative measures we can take, what type of monitoring measures we can take. And that actually leads to a better overall management of the pest issues. Because if we just go and use chemicals, you'll start having resistance issues. Um, as we saw, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, or even before that, when they were just using DDT, you know, there was, a, there was uh, environmental issues. And so now we're going towards chemicals that are much better for the environment. Um, we're looking at uh, sanitation, preventive measures, inclusion measures, and that overall has led to a better management of insects that's safer for the environment, safer for people, and um, we don't have as many resistance issues. So I think it's always important to have this concept in our mind um, instead of just relying on chemicals alone. And so in order for an IPM plan to work though, we have to have a bunch of different other factors in place, which would include um, cooperation with your pest management provider, um, and then also cooperation of your team members. So hopefully everyone is educated, either the house cleaning staff, the maintenance staff, and the other uh, users of that facility are aware of some of the different uh, types of pest issues and why it's important to take preventative measures, why, it's, why sanitation is important, um, and that that overall cooperation can lead to less pest issues in the long run. Now I'm going to cover some of the big pest issues that you can have seasonally and we're going, we're in the summer right now. And so I listed four major pests that I thought, you know, you might experience uh, in your facilities. And one of these is flies. And flies is a really large group. And this would include fruit flies, board flies, um, house flies, blow flies. And these all can take an advantage of sanitation problems. And so I'm sure everyone has seen what happens if you leave a banana or an apple in your garbage for a week um, over the summer. You probably started to see fruit flies uh, develop in that. Or even if you walk into the grocery store, there may be some fruit out or um, even sometimes even onions um, that have been maybe out a little bit too long. You might see some fruit flies flying around. So that's really a sanitation issue um, where they are actually breeding in the fruit or the vegetable matter that is starting to decay. And that is, you know, it can be a really easy solution just to get rid of that fruit, um, take care of the garbage, and then you won't have fruit flies anymore. And so this goes for a lot of the other fly issues, such as the forward flies, um, which when I was living down in Florida were a much bigger issue. Um, if I was in December and didn't change my garbage every week inside my house, it wasn't a huge issue, but then you get into uh, July, August, um, and if you're not taking out the garbage constantly, uh, those four flies are going to come in and they're going to infest the garbage and then they're going to be running around uh, the kitchen area. And so you can see the same thing happen in uh, any type of facility that has garbage on the interior where um, these will come in. They're really hard to exclude um, and they're just can be solved completely by sanitation. So I wanted to kind of run home with, you know, this is the breeding areas for these flies are 
usually garbage and other fruit matter and whatnot that people are discarding into garbages and cleaning up um, having good sanitation policies will go a long ways. Now, I also have um, mosquitoes here. Skip, this is a video. I'm going to go to my mosquito slide first. And these are actually flies as well. Um, and maybe not everyone knows that. And so they are kind of related to house flies and fruit flies in a way. Um, but they're really unique in that they have this aquatic life stage. And so this is actually mosquito larvae here that are in this little tree hole. Um, that I took a picture of in Florida. And um, it's really important to keep in mind in your exterior of your facility that you don't have standing water in even containers. Um, so it could be uh, uh, like clogged gutters. It could, if you have a flat roof um, and you have uh, leaf litter uh, clogging up the drainage system on a flat roof of your facility, um, you can get mosquitoes. They're, they're, I was told that you could just have like a cap of water like this, um, and that's enough water for mosquitoes to breed in. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot. And so there's this kind of aquatic stage here that these mosquitoes have that, you know, if you're not unaware of it and you start seeing mosquitoes, um, that's probably where they're coming from. There's probably some area of water that they're taking advantage of. So mosquitoes are really tricky sometimes um, and can be cryptic in where they're coming from but you can take measures to reduce the probability of them finding something that will be a good area for them to breed in. And I'm gonna go back to this uh, ant slide here. And this is a, a video that I'm gonna play of some odorous house ants at a facility that are coming out of a small opening here. So, uh, this is, uh, you can see that these ants are trailing. So ants are social insects and they actually use these trail pheromones to alert the other ants of where they need to follow to find a food source. And so you can really stop this off as you can see by sealing up that little opening there. Um, and so ants are gonna kind of have a team effort and where they find the food inside a facility, get in in the, summer and um, if they can find some food, you'll have some major, you could have some major issues. So um, ants can be a really big pest in the summer, but if you take exclusion measures, sanitation measures, um, and work with your pest control provider, they, they won't be as big of an issue. I'm going to go to my last summer pest that can be a major problem is uh, stinging insects. And so there's a lot of different types of species um, there is uh, paper wasps, there is yellow jackets, you can even have honeybees. Um, these are, can all be major issues in facilities. Um, this is a picture right here of a paper wasp nest right on the top of a door frame uh, where the door opens up. And that, so that could be a singing hazard. If someone opens the door, there's paper wasps right there. And if someone got too close to that, they could actually get stung. I think a bigger issue, a uh, stinging insect pest would be yellow jackets, uh, where they will actually nest in wall voids areas of facilities, and they might actually be able to find their way into like an office area. And so I've seen that before. Um, and so it's really important to be kind of on the lookout over the summer as these colonies are maybe getting larger and larger, uh, just to be on the lookout that you, if you start noticing some activity where there could be a nest, um, you wanna make sure you act quick and so that you're not dealing with a very large nest in August or in September. And so it's really good to kind of be proactive um, and just be on the lookout for that. So make sure your staff are aware of those stinging insect issues because some people can be allergic. Um, and if they have a really bad allergic response, which is called anaphylaxis, um, there is people that have died uh, from stinging insect sting before. Now I'm gonna go into some fall and winter pests. And this is very uh, regional specific. And so if you're down in Florida, you're gonna have different fall and winter pest issues than if you're up in the New England area or in the Midwest um, or if you're out West. So, so some of these pests that I, I'm gonna show you, you may have never seen them before, they may not be in your area, um, but, it, but there's some general bi biology that is very, um, I guess, across the board, across the, the US that there is all this, this pattern. 
of uh, there are certain insects that will try to go into uh, void areas and structures in the winter because the adult uh, life stage of that insect is the stage that tries to hide from winter cold temperatures. And so if you're in any type of area where you have insects that do that, um, you could have these potential overwintering pest problems. And this first picture is of kudzu bug, which uh, we have throughout kind of eastern, mostly in the eastern United States area. Um, and these feed on kudzu uh, plants, which uh, can are also invasive. So both the kudzu bug and the kudzu plant are invasive uh, from uh, Asia. And the adult stage of this kudzu bug that is a plant feeder will try to get into houses or into facilities in the um, fall time. And then they'll overwinter. And then in the spring, they'll go out and feed on plants again and then lay their eggs in, this, in the end of the spring and the cycle will continue. But the problem is, is the, they're trying to get in and once they get into a house or into a structure, a commercial structure, then if, the, if you have a really warm winter, um, like maybe a week there, it's like up into the 50s or 60s, it may actually activate these overwintering pests like kudzu bugs, and they'll actually try to get out of the void area. And so all of a sudden you're having like hundreds or thousands of kudzu bugs trying to get into people's office space areas. And so it can be kind of a big problem. And so it's good to try to prevent them from getting into these structures first. And I have a couple other uh, overwintering pests that I wanna show you too, just to kind of be on the lookout for. The next one is a brown marmorated stink bug. Um, you can see this one, it has the, the antenna right here has these little white bands on it that are kind of separated from some of the other stink bug insects that we have in the United States. And so this is another one that is a plant feeder and will try to get into houses or into commercial buildings in the fall and it'll hide in the void areas and potential for them to um, activate at some point during the winter if you get a little a uh, warm spell, they might try to get into office areas or any other facilities that you have. Another common one is uh, box elder bugs. These are, you can see there's kind of, they have these interesting little red and black patterns uh, on their bodies that is very distinct held up apart. And so once again, these will overwinter in the fall and uh, try to get into structures and then pop out potentially in the winter. And if they don't, uh, they'll just carry on uh, into the spring and then come out and restart their life cycle again. But I've, I've definitely seen these where you'll see tons of them on the side of a building and then they're gonna make their way into the void area. Um, and then if you have any type of uh, change in temperature in the winter time, or one time we had a facility that had a pipe break in one of the void areas and that flushed out all these like hundreds and hundreds of box elder bugs that we didn't even know were there. Um, into the office areas. And so people weren't happy. And um, it's, you know, it's really good to uh, be on top of that and try to take some action beforehand so you don't have to end up dealing with this like disaster situation where you have thousands of insects um, that you didn't even know were hiding out in your building and now they're running all over the place. So um, definitely can be a big, big issue um, depending on what part of the country you're in. Now, I also have this second bullet point you see here, which is called occasional invaders. And this is kind of a very large group and encompasses things such as springtails. Uh, this is a picture of millipedes, centipedes, crickets. These are all insects that are out in the environment naturally and can't actually survive on the inside of a structure, which is the same thing for overwintering pests. You could actually classify overwintering pests as occasional invaders as well. And so they're just out in the environment and there could be a change in climate, uh, the temperature could drop suddenly, and or there could be a ton of rain and they'll make their way into a house or into any type of other structure. And you'll get this large uh, number of insects all of a sudden inside and, um, you know, people will call about it, and have, you know, they don't want bugs running around. So, um, but a lot of this has to deal with they're finding gaps in door frames, they're finding gaps in windows or other areas and they're making their way in and that can all be resolved with exclusion. Um, and so these are just kind of a, a general category of pests that they will get inside, 
they just won't permanently infest uh, that structure usually. They don't really have a food or the right temperature or humidity to survive. Um, and they will end up dying anyways, but um, they're certainly not, they can be uns unsightly uh, to certain uh, customers. So keep in mind. So the, the next uh, pest issues would be in the spring. And uh, this is a picture actually of termites. And so depending on where in the country you are, if you're in the Southeast, if you're in California, uh, we've got major termite problems in those areas where if you're not aware about termites, um, you certainly should be, because if you have any type of wood frame structure for your facilities, these can actually cause a lot of damage to them. And so this is a picture I took when I was in Miami of drywood termites, um, and, but there's other types of termites such as subterranean termites, and these will actually feed on the wood and cut and cause damage to the wood. And typically a lot of these species will swarm um, their reproductives have wings um, that they will swarm in the spring. And so all of a sudden you'll have like a thousand or hundreds of uh, termites with these wings flying around uh, inside a building. And people are like, oh, what are these? And um, yeah, usually it's uh, termites. And so it's kind of, even though they can be feeding on the wood the entire year, sometimes you don't really know that they're there until uh, the spring comes along. So that's one uh, pest to be on the lookout for. And then, of course, uh, I had already mentioned ants, um, but th these can be a major pest in the spring. And they'll all of a sudden, uh, you know, once it starts warming up, this is one of the first pests that you start to see. And they'll sometimes start making their way into structures looking for food uh, to support the colony. So one of the, I, I didn't want to just talk about seasonal pest issues. I also wanted to talk about some ongoing pest pressures. Um, and this would include cockroaches. Um, cockroaches are a major issue in any type of facility. Um, it seems like sometimes the older the structure, the more prone you can be to American cockroaches. And so there's a bunch of different types of cockroaches, but this is a picture of American cockroaches. And a lot of times they're associated with uh, sewage systems. So this is in a maintenance area and these cockroaches can be in the sewers, they can be in sewage injection pit areas and they'll follow their ways in, in piping throughout a building and they'll pop out, um, you know, in a kitchenette area or at a water fountain. And they usually don't have food there to survive and so they'll end up dying, but no one likes seeing like a large cockroach run around across the floor. Um, and so this is kind of a big pest problem issue. I'll go on to the next slide, which will, should be a picture of German cockroaches. So in addition to American cockroaches, there's also German cockroaches, which are much smaller. And um, you can see they have these little black stripes uh, on them that's kind of unique. And these are usually associated with sanitation issues, food or sanitation issues, usually found in kitchen areas. So if you have a commercial kitchen in your facility or even kitchenettes in your facility, um, this is kind of where you usually find them. They can breed entirely in that small area. So whereas American cockroaches are probably finding in uh, sewer areas or piping that's attached to sewer areas, these can be actually right in that kitchen there. Um, and usually it involves that they were brought in by someone at some point and have found food and water there that they can live off of. Now there, in this picture, there's one other insect other than cockroaches in it. And I don't know if you guys noticed that, but there's actually bed bugs also in this picture. Um, and I, I'll try to, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, um, but there is bed bugs actually yeah, there you go, there's a bed bug. And so this was a sticky trap that was actually the multi-unit housing area that caught both bed bugs and cockroaches in it. So, um, you know, if you think cockroaches are bad, imagine having cockroaches and bed bugs. I mean, that's like a disaster right there. Um, but bed bugs are an ongoing pest pressure that can be at any time of the year. And um, if you don't have a bed bug plan yet um, at your facility, I would definitely consider one. Um, just so you have an action plan if, if you have a customer or uh, any type of employee that ever ends up bringing bed bugs into a facility, um, it, it does happen sometimes. So, um, and uh, my final ongoing pest issue is uh, we're going to talk about rodents. And so this next slide is actually a picture of some mouse damage. And this was in a kitchenette area at an office where mice kind of gnawed through this wood here and created this hole. 
And so that's one sign, but also you've got um, droppings. You can see some droppings here of mice. Um, and so house mice are one type of rodent pest that you can have. Um, Royer rats, roof rats are another type of rodent pest that you can have in your facilities. And the one thing about these pests here is that um, for Nori rats and roof rats, it only takes about a, a quarter size hole for them to get into your facility and about a dime size hole for um, house mice to get in. And so if you look at the outside of your structure, you're going to probably do an like inspection and you're like, oh man, there's a lot of <laughs> openings that these mice or rats can get into the structure. So it's really important to kind of um, keep that in mind. And once they get in, they can be certainly a major problem and no one wants to see uh, inside a place where they work at. So we know a little bit of background, but what, what can we do about this to prevent these pest issues as more and more people are coming into our facilities? Um, what can we do to prevent maybe some problems that we had pre-pandemic um, from happening again? And so I think one of the most important things for a lot of these pests is sanitation. And if you think about for, I think just about every pest I covered, they need food, water, and shelter to survive. Um, for bed bugs, they kind of combine the food and water together. So if they feed on blood, that's kind of a one and done thing for them. But a lot of other pests like cockroaches, they need food, water, shelter. Rats, they need food, water, shelter. So when you see something like this, this picture on the left, where you have this maintenance area and there's some type of water leak, they're gonna have, if they don't have pest issues now, they're gonna have pest issues. They could have um, all sorts of fly problems, um, cockroaches would love this, uh, you know, you'd want to get this fixed. So cleaning up spills fairly quickly, any type of water leaks, gut water leaks is going to lead to all sorts of problems. Um, and so it could be fly problems, cockroach problems. I did talk about termites. So if you have a wood frame structure and you have a water leak and that wood is getting wet, um, that can attract termite damage. So places I've seen, commercial structures I've seen with uh, any type of termite activity usually is associated with some type of water issue, either on the roof or maybe a water leak or any type of drainage problem. So keep that in mind too. On the next uh, picture, I have a picture of some waste uh, removal problems. So this was at a park over in Atlanta, um, but I've seen similar stuff at facilities too. If you go into like a parking garage on the outside, or um, I have seen, unfortunately, places where it looked like the garbage can hadn't been emptied in a year or two. And so this will attract rats, this will attract all sorts of flies. Um, and then you're just having this huge breeding population right next to your building. And it's not gonna take long for those flies or those uh, rodents to figure out a way into your structure. And so it's good to like, not even think about the interior structure and making sure things are clean but the exterior structure um, and making sure you're not attracting pests onto the property or creating huge breeding populations that are going to spill over inside. Um, and so sanitation of garbage on the inside, sanitation on the outside is very important. Uh, so you don't attract different types of fly pests, cockroaches, um, rodents, et cetera. And so this is, this is uh, it's interesting. I, 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 as I, I bought a house last fall, and I've been getting more and more into gardening and types of plants. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to create a jungle at your workforce, though. So, like, I love gardening, but if you bring the plants inside, you can create a, a fungus gnat breeding environment. And so it's good to have policies on the number of plants that you can have on the inside and making sure that people aren't overwatering these plants um, because if they're thinking that they're not going to have fly issues, uh, unfortunately, you know, having that many plants in inside a building, and I've seen stuff worse than this, um, can lead to all sorts of types of pest problems. And moving these potted plants from the outside to inside can bring in ants uh, and other types of pests. So it's good to have some type of uh, program, um, if you don't have one already, to regulate uh, uh, different types of plants that are brought into a facility if you're starting to have pest issues. So when we're looking at the outside, it's, it's also good to reduce breeding populations. Uh, and you can see here, this is kind of an overgrown area that was actually having some rodent issues. 
And um, if you have tons of vegetation, that's gonna provide a great habitat for rodents that can hide from predators. Um, and so they love this type of uh, vegetation. I don't know if that's, uh, uh, I think this was a, nor we were having nori rat problems at, at this facility here. And so they can burrow in um, through that vegetation and like they'll feel completely safe. And so you wanna cut uh, plants away and have a kind of a clean area around your facility so that you can do inspections. Um, if you wanna put out rodent bait stations, that could be another option uh, to be able to prevent that. But yeah, having good uh, management practices of the environment that you live in um, and work in can prevent pest problems. Now here was an interesting one. So this was another rodent issue where this was at a um, apartment complex that I guess a tenant was putting out food for the rodents. Um, and so they're putting out like bananas and pineapples and roof rats are just going to love that. So, you know, sometimes you know, we, we can do everything with maintenance and with housekeeping, have good sanitation, but sometimes uh, there's human behavioral problems at stake here that you have to correct um, and have policies for and how you're going to deal with that. And so this is one example, but I know bed bugs are another problem where sometimes, uh, you know, if you have an uh, employee that um, is bringing in bed bugs, if that's determined, or having policies on what happens if a, a employee brings in bed bugs um, is, is one thing to think about because uh, you can keep on treating the area where the employee is sitting or resting, but you know sometimes that's actually a, more of an HR issue uh, to get involved in than actually a pest management issue. So that's just one thing to keep in mind is uh, sometimes you have to you know, manage people to be able to manage some of these pest problems. So after you, you know, sit, well, sanitation is very important, um, which is going to attract pests and be able, have them be able to feed on to those different types of food products. Exclusion is, an, is probably my, I would say these two, sanitation and exclusion are probably the two most important things for uh, preventing pest problems. And so if you're thinking about, like we were just talking about quarter size opening for rats, dime size opening for mice, and then any type of crack that uh, is really, you know, you can see light coming through, it's probably big enough for an insect to get through. Just keep that in mind on being able to seal those places up and um, making sure that those pets can't get into the facility or even between different compartments within the facility from maybe a kitchen area into an office space area. Um, that's also important to keep in mind if you have multi-use uh, facilities and different types of businesses present. So the, the picture on the right here um, is some um, utility penetrations on the outside. So if you walk around your facility, um, it's important to kind of have an idea of what are these penetration areas, these openings that can be coming through our facility that could be allowing pests through. So uh, a mouse or a rat or any type of insect could easily come through that uh, opening where there was, there was a PVC pipe there at one point, it was removed and it was never sealed up. Um, and so once they get into that wall void area, then they've got access to the rest of the building. And so unfortunately, you know, building construction has these wall voids um, where we have pipes going through, elect electrical uh, um, wires going through, but you can also have pests going through them. So um, once they get into that wall void area, it can be a major problem. Um, and so preventing that by sealing up those cracks or gaps can um, lead to a lot of pest reduction. So, and it, so this is a really big opening. So you could probably get a raccoon through that. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, just looking for large openings, um, windows left open, uh, you know, if there's any type of crawl space. Uh, this was actually a, a basement area that had a vent um, that led into the basement. But yeah, basement windows, ground floor windows left open. Those can be easy areas for rodents um, and any type of pest to get into. Um, I've seen raccoons get into uh, facilities because people were leaving doors and windows open, uh, you know, overnight. It's just a, a really good practice to make sure and do an inspection that all these gaps and openings are uh, closed up. All right, so I, I was talking about American cockroaches following like sewer lines or water lines throughout a structure. And this is an example of, a, this is a water fountain where you can see there's a, a American cockroach head poking out there. And it was just small enough that the cockroach got stuck and died here. Um, but it kind of illustrates that 
you need to make sure that all these areas are sealed up with caulk uh, so that if you can't control the cockroaches in the sewers and they're somehow getting into this old structure, you can still prevent them though from spreading throughout the building, getting up on the fifth floor, coming out at the water fountain and running around on the uh, floor where people are seeing them. You know, if you just caulk that area right there, that would have never happened in the first place. And if we put pesticide out there, the cockroach would die if it contacted it, but it's gonna probably die once it gets out anyways, because it's not gonna have any food or water to live off of. So really the best solution for this is to actually just do exclusion work um, instead of actually putting out a pesticide. And here is, I was telling about seeing, being able to see light through a crack in an opening to the outside. So you can see here, this is a window um, at the basement level of the office complex, and you can see light there. So to me, that means if you've got centipedes, millipedes, crickets, any of these occasional invaders, any of those overwintering pests that we had talked about um, can make their way through that crack into the basement area on the ground floor. And then they can get into other areas of the facility. Once they're inside, um, you know, it doesn't take much for them to get up onto the second floor. Um, so kind of looking around there, making sure you have really good weather stripping on doors and windows can really lead to a, a big pest uh, reduction in a facility. And so the, one of the final things, this is kind of a new uh, technology that's been um, going around in the pest control industry for the last couple of years. And this is rem remote monitoring. So there's actually rodent stations, bait stations, if you're familiar with those, or even rodent snap traps that have the ability to be monitored 24 seven digitally over either a cellular network or a Wi-Fi network. Um, and so this is, if you haven't heard about this already, um, you know, I would certainly uh, contact, uh, you can contact Orkin. We have uh, different types of devices available where you can monitor ongoing pest rodent activity 24 seven. So if you're concerned about rodents, um, this is a, a really good new technology available to be able to see in real time and not wait a week or not wait a month or whatever your uh, inspection intervals are at, um, you can find out that day if there's rodent activity. So it's pretty amazing how far technology has gotten in the last couple of years. All right, so now we're gonna get on tips for uh, pest control success. And so I, I wanted to kind of talk about specific industries um, that you may have and some of the different types of things to keep in mind on where your priority should be at in dealing with different types of uh, pest issues. And so if you have a healthcare industry, I think one of the most important things that I've seen is on exclusion and maintenance. Um, there's, I think a lot of the American cockroach issues that I've seen have been in uh, some of these healthcare institutions where you have older large hospitals or um, even uh, urgent care facilities that you have American cockroaches getting in through the piping system and are, are showing up in uh, hematology or uh, radiology or any of these um, uh, uh, different types of uh, specific centers within a healthcare area. And that could have been resolved by exclusion in like the water fountain area or um, looking at the piping systems in the building and making sure that those are serviced well and there's not openings that the cockroaches can get into. And this is a major maintenance issue, but working with the maintenance and establishing it as a priority. And I know the maintenance uh, uh, personnel are always having tons of things they have to fix, um, but you could make it a, a priority uh, for them to uh, work on and making sure that these pests are actually not even getting into the healthcare setting. And so I think that's one uh, important area to keep in mind um, if you have any these type of healthcare faci facilities is to have that conversation with maintenance and can we make pest management exclusion a priority um, in this case to make sure we don't have these pests getting into it in the first place because a lot of time putting out pesticides um, depending on the pests in, in these type of areas is not something that you know the client or uh, the doctors or even the medical people getting service are going to want so um, you know, in these type of sensitive areas, sometimes occlusion or non-chemical control methods are the best. In the hospitality and uh, multifamily housing areas, 
certainly bed bugs are a big concern. Um, I think this is a big uh, PR issue. Um, if it, you know, if it gets out that, oh, we got a major bed bug problem, no one wants that. No one wants to get on the news because of that. So having staff training, I think, is really important for people that are uh, working with clients or any type of people that are living in these facilities, um, interacting with them, having a plan on what happens if we have bed bugs, having staff training, continue training, um, making sure that uh, people are aware of the bed bug issues. And fortunately, this has been something I think most people are starting to uh, have a good grasp on over the last 20 years or so since uh, bed bugs first kind of resurged um, in the early, or I guess I'd say late 90s, early 2000s. And then um, for food handling establishments, sanitation is probably a very big uh, problem um, is making sure that there isn't food debris, there's not uh, pest uh, breeding areas that um, are gonna lead to food contamination. Um, we certainly don't want any type of insects getting into food products. We don't want um, the food itself becoming food for insects that are gonna breed and uh, lead to food contamination. So I think sanitation is a really big important thing for any type of uh, food handling uh, area um, that could lead to uh, you know, potential issues if it's not resolved. And then for logistics, uh, I like to think of uh, monitoring pest activity and looking at uh, trends and um, using ILTs as a way to make sure that we're not getting any of our products that we're making or shipping infested in our warehouses or uh, any areas uh, using these like ILT monitors or any type of other monitors that are available for, for specific type of pests. So those are just kind of some things I like. I wanted to point out for specific uh, industry areas, um, whereas before I was kind of just talking in general. We can move on to the next slide. So ultimately though, I think this, there has to be a relationship with your pest control provider in order to be successful. And so there had, it's gotta be a two-way street where the pest control provider is, is wanting to uh, work with you on, on what your expectations are. And you know, there has to be some type of discussion on you know, if we need to do sanitation or if we need to do exclusion, um, the more cooperative that relationship is, I think the better the overall outcome is and what you'll see with a reduction in, in pest pressure. So whenever, you know, at Orkin, we've had uh, uh, really high cooperation and interest in taking the needed steps to take these preventative measures or resolving certain types of sanitation or uh, exclusion issues. We've always seen really good success with uh, dealing with that pest problem. And and then this is just kind of some, uh, if you want to learn more, these are some different sites you can go to. Um, and I think that is it. If Wonderful. 45 almost. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Ben. That was great information. We do have uh, quite a few questions coming in. Just a reminder, everyone, you can send in your questions using the Q&A panel at the bottom, and we'll get through as many as possible. Um, so a few questions on, um, somebody said, can you give some insight of pests, I'm uh, sorry, can you please explain pest sighting survey versus pest assessment activity? Sighting survey versus pest assessment activity? Yeah. Um, I don't know for sure. I okay. might get back to them on that. No problem. Somebody was asking about, you mentioned the German cockroaches in the, um, can you talk about, so he's wondering how to control them in a refrigerated, in refrigeration insulation once it's developed, or can you just give any um, points on how to kind of manage German cockroaches? Yeah, um, so German cockroaches can be very tricky because, um, they can have a lot of resistance problems with insecticides. Uh, so I don't know what your provider is currently, or if you're if you're working with a provider yet um, that is currently trying to tackle this issue. But um, usually rotating of insecticide products. So we you if the sanitation issues have already been resolved and you figured out what they're feeding on and that's already fixed, but you're still having problems. Um, there's different types of bait products that can be used for German cockroaches. Um, but what I've seen is sometimes people rely on a specific type of, of bait product or 
specific type of chemical, and it's just not having any type of efficacy. Um, and so we we put out monitoring traps before, and it's like, oh, we've been using X Y Z bait product, and it hasn't been killing them. And then we switch to a new, we rotate to a new product, and all of a sudden all of them die. So it could be a resistance problem um, that you're having if you have the sanitation issue covered, um, and uh, you've kind of resolved why are they there, why is this a problem, um, and you're looking for a control treatment. I would look at talking to your provider and seeing, oh, can we you know, try to rotate to a new product or um, that type of thing. But yeah, it's kind of something that is, it can be very difficult um, if you start dealing with uh, cockroaches that have pesticide resistance issues. Great. And then we have another um, attendee that's asking for the correct name of the bug that was after the stink bug slide. So I don't know, Paul, if was you- Is that the box elder bug? Well, maybe if you can take the slides back a little bit. So, so that's a box elder. That's a brown marmorated stink bug. Okay. Box bug right there. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, you'll see. Um, I actually saw these in Atlanta earlier this spring, and there was multiple life stages running around. Um, they'll feed on ash and maple trees, um, but really they're associated with box elder trees, which is a these are all native um, insects and then native trees that they're feeding on. So I think out of all the things I was showing you, this is like the only native pest problem that I was talking about. Um, but yeah, sometimes we've, we've talked about removing box elder trees themselves as a, a potential solution, but unfortunately they can also feed on maple and ash trees. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so it's good to have uh, native trees in your area. Um, but usually, Exclusion is one of the things that uh, you have to look at for these. So look at utility penetrations where they're coming in um, and uh, trying to make sure things are sealed up so that they don't get into a facility is a really good uh, step. And you don't have to use insecticides on these either. You can use soap and water uh, solution, just spray them uh, with soap and water and that'll, that'll kill them. You don't have to spray them with an insecticide or you could just vacuum them up with a shot vac. So, um, don't always have to go to the extreme level of, uh, of insecticides for some of these pests. So um, those are just some little side pointers. Perfect. Um, can you talk about methods to prevent flies in summer in buildings? Yeah, I think, uh, so I guess it depends on what flies you're dealing with. Um, so for fruit, fruit flies, I've seen a lot of problems associated with uh, uh, getting rid of garbage appropriately. And same thing with forage flies. Um, we were actually, it was interesting back in last year, we were getting a lot of reports of forage fly issues in apartment complexes or condos. And I think what was happening is you were having people deciding to leave and go stay with family during the pandemic shutdown and leaving their fridge or with their garbage uh, <laughs> not removed. And they were turning to this big fly breeding ground and it was starting spreading to neighboring uh, units. Um, and so that kind of showed like how important it is to have good sanitation. Uh, and so I think for the small fly issues, getting the garbage problem under control, um, forward flies can also be associated with sewer ruptures. Um, and so that could be a, a potential plumbing issue. Um, for larger flies like blow flies, house flies, um, if you have a garbage loading dock area compactor, that, that is usually a really big problem to deal with. Um, and we've looked at, you can get the sanitation down there, which is, you know, how good the sanitation can you really get for that type of area. Um, you can look at putting in, uh, we've looked at electrocutor traps on the inside, which will actually zap uh, the, the flies there. But of course, you don't want to have those spacing uh, the outside that could actually draw in flies. So it can be kind of tricky. Um, and I would definitely work with a provider that is experienced with the area. You can kind of walk through and show them, uh, him or her, like, what is this specific problem uh, if you're dealing with blow flies or um, which are the metallic blue or green flies or house flies. Those can be a little bit more, more tricky. Perfect. You talked about some of the eradication methods and, and making sure things are sealed up properly. Um, and no, no holes getting in 
how often should that be replaced or checked um, to make sure that that's still a proper barrier? Um, I, you know, I guess probably for maintenance wise, they probably don't have time to <laughs> check up on it after it's like, sometimes you're lucky if, you know, you've gotten that done after a year or two. Um, and if the pest control company is doing it, that's certainly something you could talk to them about and have them during their inspection be on the lookout for. So it's probably easier for the pest control company to keep out a look at it than maybe the maintenance people. Um, so that would be my, my advice for that. If you're doing in-house, um, then you'll have to kind of work out the timing on that. But uh, one thing I, you know, I forgot to mention is that if you're excluding for insects, it's different than excluding for rodents. Um, so sometimes people like to use this foam sealant or just caulk and think that that's gonna keep out rodents. Um, it won't. You, you have to make sure you have some type of uh, rodent proofing material. It's usually made out of metal. Um, there's a bunch of different types of products you can use that if you're gonna do exclusion for rodents, make sure your design is, is gonna actually keep them out because like that foam seal up or um, uh, using caulk is not gonna keep rats or mice out, unfortunately. We have another question from an attendee that I'm not sure um, how familiar you'll be with it, but they were just asking about birds, um, both birds on the outside of the property and then small birds getting inside the property. Do you have any ex experience with birds? Yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 kind of I, when you start getting into like vertebrate pest issues, it, it gets interesting because um, I feel like insects are very predictable. Birds are so smart. Um, I've seen birds activate like the remote um, detection devices on doors and make it through multiple doors to get inside a building. And it's like, well, how are we going to get this? <laughs> this is what we're dealing with with uh, with some of these starling issues. Um, and so a lot of that is, uh, unfortunately, you know, if you get one in, um, you're going to have to do, uh, we actually ended up just, um, being able to catch it in like a bag and, and, and drawing it to an area and trapping it out. Um, but, uh, so sometimes if you just have a one-off here or there, but certainly, um, keeping doors closed is very important to keeping any type of wildlife out doors and windows, um, not having food sources that attract birds to those areas. So if you have a loading dock area, um, we've actually done exclusion um, in the rafter areas of the loading dock. So they don't have areas where they can nest and, and hang out. You wanna try to reduce the areas that they can kind of hang out at um, if you have like food sources at dumpsters and stuff that are close to entrance ways into a building. So um, you can get bird netting to do that. Um, you'd have to get a pest control provider to be able to kind of solve that type of problem and um but yeah looking at there is bird exclusion options um with a uh, bird netting that you can do and then if they're perching on certain areas um there's some other options there's electric strips there's uh uv optical gels that you can use there's tons of different options and uh you know you could talk with a provider and see like oh what you know is specific for my my problem um but yeah birds can be tricky uh, we have another question about inside the office. They have a kitchenette and they've noticed relentless reappearing flying bugs near the sink. Um, sounds like there might be fruit flies. Can you just talk about ways to um, handle kind of, you talked a little bit about it, but anything else? Yeah, so, so there's a bunch of different things that could be in that drain. Um, it could be, there's a dark eyed fruit fly, which is actually the picture of the fly that I have there. They, they will actually breed into drains um, and then you also have drain flies themselves that can breed in drain. So um, if it's a garbage disposal area, uh, we, we actually do have uh, bioremediation products at Orkin called ActDesign, um, where it's these uh, beneficial bacteria, I guess you could say, that you will put into a drain area and it actually helps break down the organic debris. Um, and so that's one thing that I would use if I'm having a drain related problem from those type of flies is to try to get rid of that food source because that what the flies are breeding in is that organic matter in that wet of organic matter in the drain. And if you can kind of scrub it, usually you have to do some scrubbing uh, to get the large pieces out and then have that bioremediation product used. Um, in addition to that, you can kind of reduce the fly issue. Um, 
one thing you can do to kind of get rid of the flies in the meantime, the ones that are flying around, um, if they are fruit flies, is you can put these, you can make these little bottle traps um, out of like a water bottle and uh, put vinegar in it. And you can take a little piece of paper and make a paper cone and put it in there and the flies will go in and then they can't figure out how to get back out. Um, and so you can make your own little do-it-yourself traps to remove some of the flies that are flying around uh, in the meantime as you work on trying to getting that drain cleaned up. Yeah, and sorry, she said these look like mini moths, if that helps. Oh, it's probably drain flies then. Yeah, yeah, those are, so that's usually, um, uh, you could try using that bioremediation product. I've also seen those in drains that haven't been used a lot. Um, and so sometimes flushing the drain with like some uh, water and mineral oil, um, but you could also use, I would also probably use bioremediation products too with that uh, is, is one thing that I would look at for moth flies as well. But that's probably what those are, is moth flies. Perfect. Yeah, she's, uh, they said that's probably the case. They hardly use the drain or the disposal. Yeah, and that's an issue for cockroaches as well, is um, if you stop using some of these, uh, not the kitchen drains, but like the floor drains, um, and those, they have something called a pea trap, and that fills up with water to prevent sewer gas from going through. Well, if that dries up, because you haven't used it in a while, you can get cockroaches coming through. Well, um, and so, yeah, drains can be all sorts of complicated issues, but um, trying to get them clean and keeping them in good working condition can prevent a lot of different types of pest problems. Great. Then one final question for you today. Um, as people are going back to the office in more of a hybrid role, they might not be there five days a week. Is there anything we should be asking the tenants or employees to be doing to help kind of pest management in more yeah, of a hybrid I think, environment? Yeah, I think the really big important thing is gonna be about food. And I know that's, that's whenever I've been in an office environment, we've had like rodent issues, it's always been someone storing food somewhere uh, in their desk, but that's always going to be a problem because you know I like to have a little stash maybe, but um, to snack on. But if people get lunch, bring it to the office, and then leave it out on their desk and they don't put it in the, the garbage area, and housekeeping misses it, and they're only coming in once a week. By the time it comes back to you know next week when they're coming back in. You could have fruit flies and board flies and you know people are going to start complaining so i think like making sure that people are cognizant about like their environment that they're not going to be there all the time um, to make sure that they're cleaning up after themselves because housekeeping could miss it um, is uh is really important um and then probably since there's less people coming in they're going to notice pest issues a lot slower but otherwise, um, and so that's probably be a, a conversation to have with housekeeping or uh, anyone that's going to be in the office more just to be on the lookout, you know, if we notice ants coming in that, into the building or something like that, because it seems wherever people are, they're kind of like the monitors of pest activity, and if you have less people coming in, you may not know that there's a pest problem until, uh, you know, months uh, later when you know, like within a week. Uh, in, in the normal uh, system that we used to have. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you for Orkin for sponsoring this and, and Ben for your excellent expertise on pest management. Any final thoughts for our audience, Ben? No, I just, uh, you know, I hope that um, you guys learned a little bit uh, from this presentation. And of course, uh, uh, Amy has my, my information. If you want to ask additional questions, we can get back to you. Great. And just a reminder, we will be sending out an email in the next 24 hours that'll have an, um, access to the slides and the archive of this presentation, as well as uh, information for continuing education credits for participating today. So keep an eye out for your e email. And thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful day.